Hi, I'm Charlie Riley. I'm the director of the NASA Museum of Art. I'm here to welcome you to really one of the most historic and wonderful shows that we've ever had. It's all art by women. And in a moment, I'm going to scoot off this screen because I think it's so important that all the women at the NASA Museum of Art, my wonderful educators, Laura Lynch, Rebecca Hirschwick, Katie Aragon, Reem Hussein, Jean Henning, are going to be introducing you to just a few of the highlights in a rich, rich show. This whole museum is filled with great work by women. And it's about time, isn't it, that this show should be interpreted, the history of it, the writing about it, the curatorial decisions would be made by women as well. I'm going to add to that list Cindy Lou Wakefield, who with Rick Friedman brought together the Ninth Street women. I'll talk about heroism in art. They are the heroines of abstract expressionism. And Lindsay Smilo, a wonderful curatorial advisor for this exhibition, taught us this fantastic term, intersectionality, about which you'll hear a little bit more later. I think that it's really important that this time has come. This is probably one of the most proud moments, I think, in the history of the NASA Museum. And I thank you so much for being a part of it. And action. And when I say action, I mean action painting. Look at this by Michael West. Michael West? <laughs> what kind of income quote puts a Michael West in a woman's show? Corinne West, of course, was her name. She took the name Michael West as her nom de plume, or I might say looking at something like this, it looks like one of the musketeers has done it, nom de guerre. Look at the way in which Michael West slings this paint. It is absolutely one of the most dynamic, fantastic gestural paintings in this whole building. And in her time, in her time, she, along with so many of the other great ones of abstract expressionism, were able to load a brush with white and blue, just like that, make these strokes. But you know, as soon as you see a Michael West, you know one of her signatures is going to be almost calligraphic. It's this, z -z 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 like this. It almost looks like the oscilloscope that you see in a laboratory. And when I say laboratory, I'm not making that part up either. She was fascinated by energy and the ways in which physicists examined energy. She shared that with a couple of other artists we might mention. Richard Pousset Dart was one of her favorites and a friend, Hans Hoffman, who briefly taught her, but then she got away from him. Even Raphael Sawyer, another one of her teachers, born in Chicago in 1908, the exact same year as Lee Krasner, who also changed her name, by the way, from Lenore. She came to New York and get right into the thick of things and became one of the great, not just painters of her time, and really, really you've got to come and see this thing in the flesh because you've got all kinds of wonderful impasto going on. And look at this glowing orange. The thing is incandescent. And yeah, if you want to make your Halloween reference, it's actually in the title. So this has got the decibels of a West Village Halloween uh, parade, right? It's just going at you with all kinds of noise and action and decibels that you think are going to blow you right out of the room. Let me add one thing about Michael West that I've always enjoyed. I like a, 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 an artist who also has a verbal side, someone who could speak about art, someone who could write about art. Michael West, in addition to the great paintings that she made, in addition to the wonderful friendships that she had with people like Gorky and Pousset Dart, Michael West was a superb poet. And looking at this just for a moment, let me give you just a taste of one of, I think, one of the best poems I've ever read about art. She wrote it in 1942. And looking at the painting as I read this to you, it's called The New Art. To arouse and seduce our ardor and make us strong with sensations so that in beauty multiplied we come alive and dream. And now for something completely different, an utter change of tone from all these gestural abstractions, from all this expressionist angst, we come to something completely different because it's so pianissimo, it's so delicate. It has something just in meditative about it. It's the work of the great painter Agnes Martin. Agnes Martin, who had come to New York from Saskatchewan, where she was born, and I hold on to that idea about Saskatchewan. Picture fields of wheat, picture those long horizons. But she came to New York from Saskatchewan, 
she was part of a really, really superb circle of artists down at Kunzi Slip that included Ellsworth Kelly, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg. I mean, she's right in the middle of it, just the way many of the Ninth Street women we, we've been talking about, they had that group. But then at a certain moment in the mid-1970s, Agnes Martin said, I'm out of here. I have to leave New York. It's, it, it's, it's too much noise. It's, I have got to get, to, I've got to go somewhere. It's an aesthetic mo moment of withdrawal from the noise of, this, of the big city. She goes out to New Mexico, where she begins to paint these wonderful quiet bands. It's very, very difficult for you to see here, but right here in the, I've got this lovely band of blue, and then a pencil line defining it, and this interval, this gap of white. It's so musical, and it's just, it's almost like a musical stage, right? And what I always enjoyed about Martin, if I could just sort of share this, is it's not as perfect as it looks. It's not as even as it looks. There are these moments where it sort of hesitates or fluctuates over that pencil line. The, the, the stroke as it goes from one side to the other begins and then pauses and then again begins until it gets to the end there. And if you attune to it, if you could just give yourself to it just for a moment, it will take you on this absolutely marvelous trip. And when she was in New Mexico, if I can add this, it's such an interesting, I think, uh, connection to Michael West. And believe me, they are utterly different artists on the, on the canvas, aren't they? But she also, Agnes Martin also, was a great poet. And she wrote these ascetic, A-S-C-E-T-I-C, -E she wrote these ascetic poems about what it is to, shall we say, take her ego away and allow, for instance, the light alone, the sensations alone, to, to take over. And let me, let me get out of the way for a second. When she was in New Mexico, Martin wrote this absolutely gorgeous poem called The Untroubled Mind. Wandering away from everything, giving up everything. Not me anymore, any of it. Retired ego, wandering on a map. One last thought about this gallery, in which Michael West and Agnes Martin have this extraordinary dialogue, two poet painters, right, but two very, very different people. There is, of course, a great moment in Shakespeare that I think pulls these two things together, and I think it shows, incidentally, the, the beauty of a, a show like this, which is a, a group show where different aspects of humanity, action and thought, or mind and body, Agnes Martin mind, Michael West body, is of course the famous soliloquy to be or not to be, which a lot of people think is just about you know, whether I should live or die. It's not, it's actually about the difference between thought and action. Where the ghost has told Hamlet he's got to act, he's got to do something physical, he's got to avenge his death. But actually Hamlet is caught in his thoughts, he's caught by his conscience, and at the very, very end he says, about this whole quandary, thought and action, he says, the pale cast of thought, and I think of the Martin, the pale cast of thought makes him lose the name of action. And isn't it wonderful that in one gallery, in one show, that you can have these two extraordinary sides of what it is to be human? Hello, we're in gallery one at the Nassau County Museum of Art. We're looking at some collection of works from the Heroines of Abstract Expressionism, a collection of work that explores the work of the Ninth Street women. Um, this, included in this very incredible group of artists is the artist Elaine de Kooning. On the wall behind me is a work that Elaine de Kooning created, inspired by her travels to France. Her love of art started at a very young age. Her mother nurtured this love by bringing in art books into their home, by going to um, museum visits, but also by letting Elaine kind of explore the idea of becoming an artist. Elaine was born in Brooklyn in 1918, and subsequently, like many other artists of that time period, moved to New York City and became an artist in the New York School. This was a group of artists that and musicians, kind of not a formal school, but a group of people that spent much time together uh, creating 
work together, becoming in influenced by each other's different techniques and processes and explorations of what it is to make art in the 1950s. Elaine de Kooning's work straddles the place between figuration, more representational art, and abstraction. And her work kind of goes back and forth between those two places. The work that we see behind me is actually a, a depiction of a bull or a bison. Um, and again, this was inspired by her travels to the caves of Lasso in France. Um, this was an area, a Paleolithic cave that captured much of the paintings of the prehistoric artist. She was quite impressed by the depiction of the animal on the caves, on the walls of the caves, struck by how the paint interacted with the cracks and the crevices on the walls of the caves. Um, so here she's kind of mimicking that in a sense, making it her own, of course, using paint and collage. So she collages some pieces of paper to capture the torso, the kind of very robust body of the bull or the bison. Um, she's using a very warm palette of oranges and pinks and rust colors. Um, and the actual body of the bison or the bull is really, the, it's defined much by this kind of very black calligraphic line that captures the movement and also the size, the kind of monumental animal um, that's on this canvas. In addition to those very pointy, up on the very top left, the pointy horns. Um, when she was very interested in kind of animating the, the bull in the sense that by painting these very quick kind of rigorous paint strokes that was uh, often seen in many of the abstract expressionist painting painters, um, this kind of animates it as if the bull is ready to kind of just break from the confines of the, the frame and escape from the painting. The second artist that I'd like to share with you today is the artist Hedda Stern. Hedda Stern was born in Romania and emigrated here to the United States in 1941. The two works behind me are an example of the investigation of looking at her new home in New York City and kind of capturing that through paint. I'd like to look at this work right behind me. Um, what we notice immediately is uh, use of black lines, these very kind of strong lines kind of traverse the canvas, um, activating the four corners of the canvas. We also notice that the lines are quite blurry on the edges. What Hedda Stern did that no other artists at that time, particularly women artists, was using spray paint, a material that's generally used for industrial purposes. She took the spray paint and made these very quick marks. And in fact, she talks about her own process of making art as if she is a bullfighter in, in an arena. She's there to kind of make this very quick gesture, um, these almost abstracted lines that stand for the infrastructure, the built environment of her dynamic new home. She was enthralled in railways and the pulsing lights of the city that could be from the trains or from ambulances or cars. This kind of dynamic, beautiful, almost iridescent orange-red orbs are kind of pulsing behind these very kind of blurry, strong marks, these lines. In the second work of art by the artist Hedda Stern, she continues with this use of these very strong black, blurry, strong lines, almost graffiti in their quality. But what we notice is as the lines, again, kind of intersect and cross over the canvas, we're left with these open spaces, these kind of negative spaces. And the closer we look at these open spaces, we start to notice specifically towards the bottom, this kind of open area that has a lot of patterning or texture, something's happening um, as we look to this kind of triangular form. We can think, if she's thinking about elevated trains and the idea of an aerial view looking down on the city, all of a sudden we can possibly imagine that this is the cityscape below this kind of elevated track above. She's very interested in capturing the speed of the lines that we see over and over in both of these works, kind of capture the dynamic kind of energy of her new home in New York City. Next to me is a work by artist Alison Janae Hamilton. 
It's a portion of an installation she did as part of her residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem and was exhibited at Piazza Milma. We have one portion of it. But for Hamilton, knowing that one person exists outside of the installation is okay with her. She actually reuses different elements because she's building mythology. And a mythology doesn't just start and stop in one story, it continues and builds into an epic narrative. And I'm gonna bring us around a little closer so we can discuss the materials that she used because for Hamilton, materiality and place is an extremely important part of the work. So let's head over. Her sculpture is comprised of palm fronds that are dipped in resin and attached to a metal repurposed signboard. Hamilton's work is about telling the story of America, particularly Southern America and rural areas. But for her, it's not about the landscape being a setting for the story being told. It is about the landscape being a protagonist within the setting. She always sources her materials from the place that she is discussing family and friends have sent them to her and she goes down and sources them herself because for Hamilton, the materials themselves are an integral part of the story that she's building, particularly a story about climate change and social injustice, about what areas of this country are being directly impacted by climate change and how that directs the story of a place. There's another artist in this gallery who also focuses about the materiality of what she is using. And we're gonna head on over to Liza Liu's work. Liza Liu is an artist who is known for working with one particular material, and that is glass beads. She created a work that rebuilt an entire kitchen and took her five years to create this just solely out of beads. And her work is about the intersection of labor and community and kind of the roles that people play in society. Her more contemporary works that she's creating now are more abstract in nature. They're not about recreating a particular place, but they're paying homage to the inherent qualities in the beads, letting them kind of take on their own forms. Here, this artwork, which seems to be a blend between painting and sculpture, it's lying two-dimensionally on the wall, but protruding out, captures light and shadow. And it's these forms that seem to be growing almost as if they are coral or lichen on a tree. Liza Liu also thinks about community in her work, but the fact is that she is working with a community of people to create her work. She does not create all of these beading pieces by herself. She actually works with a group of women she has hired to be studio assistants in South Africa because they are masters of the craft of using beading and she works with them to source her materials and build components and then puts them together to create this one artwork. We're standing in front of Warren Lambrecht's wall installation, uh, which is um, a wonderful movement of color and pattern going right across this wall um, in, in lovely forms from nature. Um, as you step closer, you begin to notice that there are actually three large panels in the background. They are photographs taken of tree bark, uh, rocks on a beach, more tree bark, and the colors and patterns sort of connect and uh, reflect and inform each other as we move across. Um, the smaller elements, when you step closer, begin to look um, like, again, more pieces from nature. They're details that Lori Lambrecht has taken from her artwork uh, so that you really focus in and notice on the beautiful color, the form, the very tactile quality of these works. Uh, more elements reveal themselves when we look a little bit closer. They're actual pieces of knitting, real knitted yarn, and other pieces of knitting and tapestry with some embroidery uh, woven into them. Uh, the uh, photographs, again, have such a tactile quality. Some of them, like this lichen, seem to just leap right off of this fabric. Uh, Lori Lambrecht's background as a photographer and a fiber artist are very much reflected in this artwork. She um, said that after she began to really knit again after doing photography, she became so much more aware of the nuances and the, the texture and the very tactile qualities of the nature that she had been photographing. And it comes across so strongly in this artwork. Facing Lauren Lambrecht's work in this gallery is another wall size installation by Jennifer Bartlett. Jennifer Bartlett's work looks extremely different from Lauren Lambrecht's, but in fact, they do share some similarities. 
Uh, both are using small elements to make up one large work of art. Uh, Laurie Lambrex are rectangular pieces and Jennifer Bartlett's are actually squares. Uh, Jennifer Bartlett works on squares of steel that have been painted with enamel, an idea she picked up from looking at uh, New York subway signs. She was looking for something that would be really easy to paint on that didn't involve the traditional stretching of canvases with stretchers and fabric and a lot of time. And this is an idea she came on in the late 1960s and has become her trademark um, throughout her whole painting career. She always works in series, as with this one. Um, when you step closer, you realize that um, each one of these steel panels has a grid that has been silk screened upon it. And on the grid are all these colored dots. The colored dots are actually hand painted. And when you get in very close, you realize that there are very subtle variations uh, between um, each dot, one dot and the other. Um, Jennifer Bartlett was trying to get down to the very simplest form of mark making, just a dot on a white surface. Um, she works on her these artworks with um, a whole formula that she's devised of her own to create this kind of progression of the way they go. And um, beginning uh, from the side, to me, it looks almost like a musical composition where it's a very kind of small, sharp staccato on one side, building to larger and larger forms. Uh, in the middle, it sort of slows down with these bigger forms and then builds again to the next. Um, the tone of it would vary uh, between the colors, the brightness of the yellow, um, the, the heat of the red, and again, the cool tones of the blue. I love when I walk into this gallery thinking of these two artists um, almost speaking to each other in a musical language. Lori Lambrex gives a sort of flowing, organic um, melody going across one wall, whereas Jennifer Bartlett's is a very percussive, sharp, brilliant tone uh, that just wakes you up. Uh, depending on the day, uh, one of these works may appeal to you, may speak to you more than another. One of the works that we're looking at right now is a sculptural piece by the Egyptian-born artist Gada Amr called Busy Number no. One or Kiss Number no. One. So to understand Gada Amr's works, we have to go back a little bit and look at her paintings on canvas. And by paintings, it's not in the traditional sense where she uses actual paint on her canvases. Gada Amr challenged the masculinity of painting that was traditionally known in the time of abstract expressionism and everything that preceded that. And she looked for a form of expressing painting that was more feminine to her or related more to women. So she looked at women's, what she thought was universally women's work, which was needlepoint and sewing. And what Gada did was she took images that resonated with her personally, uh, put them across a canvas repeatedly and began embroidering and embroidering and sewing them, or the outline of them, and then allowing the strings to hang off the canvas in sort of this very painterly, uh, drippy manner. Uh, so in looking at her sculptural work, you see a little bit of those lines, that linear quality of her paintings in this as well. Hidden in this work are images of figures kissing. Usually in Gada Amr's work, you'll see she relates a lot of imagery to pornography. And the reason that she does that is that she's, it's more of a personal uh, way of exploring her sexuality as a woman and finding that in pornographic magazines were usually marketed towards men and not towards women. And women's magazines were generally about uh, the things that she explored as being traditional women's work, which would be about, uh, you know, gardening or cooking or the idea of fashion magazines being solely for women. So she explores that a little bit with these sculptural works and that she uses those same imageries that she uses in her embroidery works related to pornography repeatedly in here as well. 
she also, being Egyptian born, she's fluent in Arabic. She was raised in France, so she's also fluent in French and she lives and works in New York. So English is also uh, a third language that she is fluent in. Um, the idea of using these linear qualities also relates back to the idea of language where, that she's explored throughout her life whether it's a form of relating it back to Arabic calligraphy um, and the, the, curve, the curved lines that we often see that are associated with that. Um, usually she works in painting, sculpture, installation, and, uh, and also outdoor sculptural pieces that are made from elements of nature. So sculpt these sculptural pieces are not very typical of, of her body of work. So it's nice and rare that we get to see some of this, uh, this bronze work that is uh, patinaed, cast and patinaed in this blue pigment. Where does your eye travel as you gaze upon Shakaya Booker's on and on and on and on? Does your gaze dart from spot to spot? Does it rest in one place or does it follow a winding path? And what are you reminded of as you look? American sculptor Shakaya Booker, uh, who works out of Allentown, Pennsylvania, creates monumental abstract sculptures uh, fashioned from old tires. Um, and this work on and on and on and on is a perfect example of her incredible ability to take um, an everyday industrial object and transform it into something organic as it twists and bends and, and reaches and scurries across the platform. Booker's work is extremely physical and highly technical. Uh, she creates models and builds armatures out of pressure treated wood and steel rods using computer software, digital technology, machinery, um, and of course, repurposing the tires themselves, which she secures from car repair shops and salvage yards. So she takes um, cast off materials and transforms them, turning waste into beauty. And her works appear at once um, soft and inviting, organic, um, but at the same time, they can seem a little terrifying and, um, and dangerous. So Shakaya Booker um, takes something that we never, well, at least I never really think of tires until we need them and turns them into something um, almost akin to alive as it blossoms and bursts with energy right before our very eyes. Um, so Booker's works are formed by slicing and twisting and weaving old tires um, to create new forms and textures. Um, her interest in tires and in rubber, the material, uh, came from um, her time in the East Village in New York City in the 1980s and she would um, find discarded or old pieces of rubber that were left over from car fires that took place um, during that time. And her interest in sewing, um, she's really been developing and, and um, her interest in sewing since she was a teenager by repurposing old clothing and adding discarded materials to her creation even as, as a young woman like orange peels and bottle caps. And so this combination of her interest in the material and her, um, her expertise in sewing really was a, a natural combination. So as you look around at this work, you can see the individual treads on the tire. You can see the name of the tire. You can see any marks and scratches of the tire itself. Um, it is very clear and meant to be that we are looking at a tire. Um, for Booker, the individual treads or the unique quality of each tire is synonymous with 
the uniqueness of, of every human being, right? So you can notice different tones and textures of each strip of rubber, and this is about human diversity. The individual treads of the tire, um, she thinks about um, wrinkled skin, uh, fingerprints, uh, scarification, visible signs of aging, almost like DNA. But for Booker, the tire itself also has an incredible symbolic significance in terms of history, industry, uh, consumer culture, and, our, um, and its effect on the environment. Um, a native of Newark, New Jersey, Booker uh, connects the tire to the factories that line the highway of her home state. So her sculptures really are a symbol of both industry and beauty. And in addition, um, her, her tires help us to think about um, our effects on the environment um, from, from this great industry. And in fact, when you walk around Booker's work, you, you kind of get a distinct smell of rubber. Um, and that's intentional. So that's part of the experience of, of being in one of Booker's works is, is smelling the city and the factory in her work. Um, Booker is a tremendous artist um, and we are thrilled to have two of her works on view in our current exhibition. Um, and by, by weaving the rubber, how you weave rubber is amazing. Um, but by weaving it, she is taking the traditionally feminine pursuit of weaving and combining it with industrial technology. And the results are large-scale public works um, that are amazing. And, and large-scale public works tend to be um, typically in a male-dominated field. So we are thrilled to have two of her works here um, in our current exhibition. And you can take time to gaze um, at her work and continuing to think about how the title on and on and on and on reflects your own experience of looking. Here we have a small but incredibly powerful work by sculptor Rona Pondic, uh, made in between 2014 and 2015, white, white, blue, gray. Um, so as we take a look at this work, we notice a figure um, sitting uh, or resting on top of a semi-transparent blue and white block. Um, the block itself has contours and lines that, and, and along with the color, that might imply water or some kind of fluidity, but the block itself is hard and inflexible. Um, on top of the box, we see a figure. But as we continue to stare at the figure, it starts to surprise us. The head is very small and very detailed, um, but the body becomes just really a, a, a mass of, of material without form and distinction. And at the ends of, of long arms, which also lack a lot of detail, are extremely detailed hands. Hands, however, that are crafted way out of proportion to the rest of the body. So we recognize this figure as distinctly human, but as we look at it from different angles and perspectives, totally not human. And this is perhaps one of the things I love about Pondick's work. There really isn't clarity. Um, it leaves me with more questions than answers. Is the figure uh, getting up or sitting down? Is the figure resting or um, is the figure just stuck? Is the figure um, experiencing trauma or content, um, asleep or awake? Um, these are questions that, that Pondick herself would never answer um, because she really embraces and acknowledges um, the idea of, of holding these two opposing realities at the same time. Some of this might come from her love 
of Franz Kafka and Metamorphosis, where she would, you know, she has said that when he would read Metamorphosis aloud, Kafka would howl with laughter. Um, other times he would say that his work is deadly serious. Um, so she holds both of those realities at the same time. She is a prolific and internationally recognized artist, um, always um, working with the human form, the human body, um, combining, creating hybrid sculptures, combining um, human and animal, or human and other kinds of nature, flora or fauna in her work. Um, and her own personal story um, is also holds these different realities. There is, there, is, um, there is distress and there is triumph in her work. And this, this perhaps might be why um, her work holds such um, heart-wrenching power because of its grace um, and, and its truth. Um, this work is part of her um, later series, more recent series, where she takes a figure or parts of a figure and places them on or even inside of these sonorous, candy-colored, bright blocks. But the mood of the piece is quite different than the bright color might imply. Right? This is a very intensely psychological work. Um, and part of that stems from the, the distortions of the body. Um, the, the playing with the scale and sort of the, the intense um, details mixed with the very uh, mass of form and shape without detail. And Pondick's works are always self-referential, always about the body, um, casting her own body, head, hands, feet, her own body parts and using digital technology to manipulate the scale and size of those parts. Um, perhaps her own sort of physical struggles are reflected in this latest series of work. Um, they are certainly reflected in the materials that she used to create them. So in uh, 2006, Pondick was diagnosed with cervical spondylitic myelopathy, which is a um, severe compression of the spine. Um, she underwent multiple very difficult surgeries and treatments in order to regain um, control of her body, and particularly her hands. Her recovery was long and difficult, and she still has persistent pain, um, but her, her recovery was hard won. Um, during the time of her recovery, she, she would spend time in bed um, creating sculptures in her mind. Um, but she eventually did recover and did regain the use of, of her hands. Um, but because of this physical limitations and the persistent pain, um, she changed the materials that she worked with. She had previously worked, among other materials, metal. Um, but our work here is made with epoxy and resin and acrylic. And these are art materials that she can manipulate easily on her own, by herself, in her studio. And she, they don't require a foundry visit or outside resources to create, which was the case in her previous sculptures. Um, so with its scale and sort of its unnerving distortions and its delicacy, uh, Pondick's work is really um, a triumph of, of the, the intellect and also the fragility of the human body. Um, it is precise, it is disturbing, it is beautiful, it is harmonious, delicate, strong, and it is curious and wondrous. And Pondick is an example of an artist doing what she loves, an artist who continues to grow and evolve and thrive despite any challenges, um, and who continues to delight, entice, and certainly to enchant audiences everywhere.